Okay, I've got that we are on page 87. Is that correct? I think last time we finished filling out what was happening on page 86, and uh, we still have a ways to go. Um, I kind of did make a decision that it's going to affect you guys. Um, I've thought about this a lot the last few weeks, and it just keeps bugging me, so I feel like I need to do what, um, what I'm feeling. I think I want to wait until fall to start book four, just because it just it's very clean to go through it. You know what I mean? And the last, uh, well, three and a half years we've been doing this. We got done early this this season. I don't know if you guys are just smarter than the other group we've had or what. I'm guessing that's what it is. So, because we got faster. It's certainly not because I'm talking less. I'm pretty sure that's not it. So, um, we've got six teachable weeks left after this, after tonight. Um, I know I wanted to do a couple weeks with uh, showing some slides about some stuff. and. And here's what we can do. If, if you want to think about something that you'd like to talk about that we've studied throughout the, these, uh, these uh, book uh, three and four, this, this last fall and, and uh, in the spring, um, we can talk about any of that. We can spend more time on anything. Um, I need to know in advance so I can get prepared for it. But I think there are several things that we could do and um, to take up the last five weeks um, of that. And like I said, a couple of the weeks, I definitely want to do some slide stuff. I, I love the slide stuff, not because just because I love it, but to me, it, it, it puts scripture in a place, you know, you, you can see what actually happened and here's where it happened. And that, that's really the fantastic thing about going to Israel is because when you go, um, you, you get to see the place, you get to actually walk and talk and, and and read the scriptures from the place and i on sunday just three days ago uh christy and i were on the temple mount a year ago sunday so it was like so cool to be up there on the temple mount and uh i think yesterday was the day we we flew home a year ago but uh just to know what happened at these places and i, I can i can show you several other things where things happened that we can talk about um, and maybe make it come a little bit more alive to you. And I can also do that with a couple of slides of where we're going to be this fall. So if you guys don't mind, we'll just start book one this fall. And it, the other advantage to doing that is it gives us plenty of time to advertise it. Because I feel like now I don't really have a lot of time to advertise. We're starting the next book because I'm hopefully some other people can join us in the fall. Make sense? So think about something that you'd like more information about or something other section of the New Testament you'd like to talk about. If something comes up, we'll we'll do that. Um, I'm not going to keep bugging you for stuff, but if something comes to your mind, um, we'll talk about it, we'll research it, and try to figure something out. Make sense? All right, well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, where we are on page 87, it's we're, we're about the year 325, and a lot has happened between uh, what we started talking about back um, in uh, 70 AD. Um, a, a lot's happened to Jerusalem. Um, it's, it's just a very Im important place. And what's happening now is as we come to 325 AD, we come up on the story of Constantine. And uh, this, this man was uh, the emperor of uh, the Roman Empire at that point, um, really almost to the end of the Roman Empire. Um, it's he, He's a guy, and, and what you can write down on your paper there where it says the story of Constantine, um, this is a story of our emperor who is really kind of a turning point for the acceptance of Christianity is really what you could write. This is really kind of a turning point. Um, Constantine kind of inherited the Roman Empire from his father, um, and he named the city Constantinople uh, for his father or himself. I don't know. And um, but he was the emperor that basically brought Christianity to the to the public. He um, his mother became a Christian and so did his wife. Um, his mother uh, was Elena and she was very well known 
what she did was she made pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And of course, she um, she had the power of Rome behind her, right? I mean, her son's the emperor, right? I mean, money is no object whatsoever. And uh, what she wants to do, um, she has this desire to really... Um, trying to think how to put it, but make Christianity live on by where things happen. So, for example, we talked last time, I think, about the uh, um, the the Church of the Nativity. And that'll be one of the things I'll show you pictures of. It's a Church of the Nativity when we do some slides. Um, the, the Church of the Nativity was, um, and, and I think a lot of things happen that get passed on. I mean, you know, like here in our country, if we say, you know, my my granddad had a lime kiln over here on the mountain, you know, you might be able to go over after 50 years, 80 years, find remnants of a lime kiln. But whoopee, hundreds of people's granddads had lime kilns, right? It's no important thing. When Christ is born <laughs> or ascends to heaven or these really big deals, it feeds the 5,000, um, whatever, all these big events happen, people don't forget where they happen because they're not like a lime kiln, little bitty thing. They, these are major events. And so if somebody says, you know, 250 years ago in that cave over there was where Christ was born and everybody in the area knows it, it probably is, or at least has some validity to it, you know, because that stuff gets passed on. And so um, it's it's almost like in our country, we have like like folk legends or, you know, stuff like that, that have some element of truth. Of course, they get twisted over a period of time. But in Israel, it's a little bit different because sometimes you can find evidence for things. Um, and so what, what Ellen did was she went to Israel and she said, I want to find out is actually as many things as I can. And uh, I want to dedicate them to, to God and I want to preserve them for future generations to know where things was. So she built the Church of the Nativity, which was built in about 300, 350, something like that, very early. And I, I told you last time about the Turks coming in and uh, conquering Jerusalem and Israel. When the Ottomans came in, um, they they ba basically destroyed everything. I mean, pretty much they wipe, wanted to wipe out Christianity because they are Muslim. And so uh, they got to the Church of the Nativity. And when you walk in the Church of the Nativity, there's a really high, uh, it's got a really high ceiling. And the wall up top there has murals on it. And it's got murals of the wise men. Because it's the Church of the Nativity. And the wise men brought gifts. And so because the wise men were up there, the Ottoman Turks are descendants from the wise men, or they believe they were. So they didn't tear that church down, which is pretty cool. And um, so when you go in the Church of the Nativity today, uh, when you walk in, there's giant pillars. They've actually built a floor about that much higher or two feet higher than the original floor over top just to, to protect the original floor. And they have like these big trap doors you can open up and look down and see the original floor. And then when you go to the front, like the up area where the altar and stuff would be. You can go down either side, but they run you down one way and you go down underground and there's a cave under there. And they got a little, it looks like a little fireplace is what it looks like. And there's a Star of David that's made out of some kind of gold. And uh, there's a hole in the ground. And uh, it's like in like a fireplace, it's kind of offset. And they said, that's where Jesus was born right there. And all these people go in and lean down and kiss that thing. Yeah. This boy's not going to kiss it. I'll take that. That's not going to happen. But, you know, people go in there and it's it's kind of a it kind of goes off one direction and another direction. This room, this big room. And you can they pack people in there and there's old tapestries hanging from the walls. And uh, and then you go back out. But the marble steps going down underneath of that thing are worn. I mean, like how I many people have to walk down a set of steps to wear it out? Um, but hundreds and hundreds of people go through that every day. Um, so what constant, what, what Elena did was she went through and, uh, she's, she's credited for, uh, building 
important churches. There's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and uh, I'll show you pictures about that. That's very, very interesting. It's it's actually controlled by, by about three different, three or four different religious groups, and it's a uh, it's a place where the Catholics believe that Jesus uh, was was crucified right there on the hill uh, inside that church. And it's also, when you walk in the front door, they got a slab of marble there. And uh, that slab of marble is what they say Jesus laid on. They took that out of the tomb. And then inside the Holy Sepulchre, uh, it's a massive building. There's a smaller church uh, inside of that. And if you go in that church, inside there is where they say you know, the cave is where Jesus died, inside that church. So um, anyway, uh, she's credited for building that church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so um, because of Constantine turning to Christianity, he literally makes Christianity the religion of the Roman world, which had never, and it, it never happened. Basically, prior to that, the, the, one of the things that Romans did that was very, very smart, they were very smart in doing so. And in fact, the British did this too. But the, what the Romans did when they conquered the world, for the most part, they would go into a place like Israel and conquer Israel and say, we're we now you're our people. But you don't have to dress like us. You don't have to eat like us. You can still have your Jewish faith. But we don't just pay taxes and don't revolt. If you do that, we're going to get along fine. You can do what you want to do. And for most countries, they'll say. Great, we can still be what we are. We just now got to pay taxes to them, and, uh, and and maybe not taxes to our local people, you know. But in Israel's case, they had to pay taxes to the Israel, the religious leaders, plus the uh, the Romans. And then you have guys like Matthew, the who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. He was a tax collector for the Romans, and uh, his people would have hated him. Uh, Zacchaeus was the same way. He well, no, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Matthew was not a chief tax collector. Um, but when the Romans conquered, they would go in and, and leave places alone, basically. And so they were able not to have it. They didn't have to enforce so much stuff. I mean, if they went in and said, you got to dress like us, you got to eat like us, you got to act like us, you got to worship what we worship. You know, it would have been a lot more difficult because people tend to revolt more. But when you go in and say, we don't care who you worship, we don't care how you dress, we don't care, we don't care how you rule yourself. Just don't get out of line and pay us taxes, you know. And so the Roman Empire really grew pretty rapidly um, and by doing that for the most part. Um, but that freed up um, people to be who they were. But then you have a guy like Constantine who gets uh, become emperor and he kind of turns to Christianity. Now. It said you got a thing in there in your book. It says the sign in the sky. What happened? And you can write what you want here. But Constantine saw a vision of a cross is what he said. And and the the sign of a cross was important to him. And so he had the sign of a cross placed on the shields of the Roman soldiers. And uh, and then after he had some victories in battle, he gave the credit. To the God of Christianity. So, um, but he, he, he believed that, you know, this sign somehow gave him victory and uh, he was much more sympathetic to Christianity. Um, I can't say for one minute that he was like um, what we might call completely, completely dedicated like Christians should be, but he didn't oppose them, you know, and, and I think that's the way the world is today. We got we got a lot of Christians in the world today who claim to be Christians, but really are not, you know, surface level, uh, but not really Christians. And that seems to be the, the, the kind of man he was. Any thoughts about any of that? Well, the Edict of Milan was an edict by Constantine, and you can write down that this happened in 313. And it was basically, it basically said, it basically ended persecution of Christians. And it, that edict then led to like 
the adoption of Christianity as the, the official Roman religion, which prior to this it had been completely pagan. Every in any and every god, it didn't matter. Um, <clears throat> but what happens when there is no persecution is people turn away from God. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, I mean, that's what happens where you have plenty of money and 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 materialism. Um, people don't really follow God. They don't need God. You know, you need God when you're getting persecuted. When you don't have food to eat, you cry out for God. When people are hunting you down to kill you, you're crying out to God. But when you got plenty and plenty and plenty and don't need, and you don't need, and you don't need, then you don't need God. And that's just the way the world works. Um, and so that kind of Christianity was uh, kind of watered down. Does that make sense? Okay, the formation of the canon. Um, so the purpose of the canon, um, there were there were many books in the in the New Testament that were or in the New Testament times that were commonly kind of accepted as not not scripture, but they were letters and writings that were that were pretty important, pretty important. But what was necessary for it to be from God um it it they they all had to have the same document for one thing see what i mean i mean if you're going to have something that's um if you're going to have something that says here's here's the word of god then what happens is we all got to agree on what is the word of god it's got to be these books and no more we can't add another one to it if we just happen to find another one. There, I mean, it's got to be time tested. It's got to be biblically uh, in agreement with the Old Testament. The books have to agree with each other. They can't contradict each other. Um, they've got to be time tested. They've got to be prophet approved. Um, I mean, it's it's it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a period of time. And so. Um, let me let me give you some thoughts about the the purpose of the canon, um, and uh, and they called it basically tests of canosity, and in in the ancient world there was a reed grown that grew in water, and it, it kind of was like it's, it's a small thin reed, and uh, they could they could actually make paper out of it and make books out of it too. But it, it kind of was like our like bamboo, bamboo. If every so far on a piece of bamboo, there's a, a piece that goes all the way through the center. It's hollow to that flat piece. You know what I mean? And those flat pieces uh, grow so far and you have another one. Then you have another. And as the bamboo grows, you know, it'll get bigger around. And but those those uh, flat pieces that separate the pieces are in different lengths. Well, with this reed that grew. It was called the canon. That's it got a nickname called the canon because that reed grew the same length every time, every single time. And so people could use it for a measurement. If they want to measure something, all they got to do is go cut down a piece of the reed and take it somewhere. And it measured the same as it did the reed I cut down last year. You know, so it, it became like the standard of, of measurement. And so that word over a period of time got to be used as referred to the scripture. You know, you got to have this measurement that says this is what Christianity is. This is what we believe. And so let me give you this, the, the purpose. Number one, the need for scripture to spell out the message of the apostles. So the scripture needed to spell out the message of what the apostles had taught. They are the ones that Jesus chose, right? They are the ones that had the authority from on high. They are the ones that that God had given uh, the message too. And so it needed to, you know, there was this need for some writing that came from the apostles that people would accept as being authoritative and accurate and a part of the canon. So it could be reliable. Number two, uh, the need to decide on what should be read in the churches. I mean, if you're going to read something in the church, you have, it has to be accurate, right? We don't want to read something that's not accurate. We don't want to read something that, you know, isn't true. 
or shouldn't be read or is questionable, and we, we have to know what, what the truth is. And so that's important. Number three, the need for a true canon to answer a heretical one. So a heretical one would just simply be the false one. There's always going to be false information, right? And the thing of it is, there's one truth, and there are millions of false truths, untruths. Um, and that's, I mean, I think we understand that. There can only be one truth, right? I mean, one, and one only. There can't be two. <laughs> there's one. That's it. And, and so that one truth has to be determined what it is. Is it right? Does it, is it validated by the apostles? Is it validated by the prophets? Is it correct with each other? Um, has it been tested over time? Um, and over a period of time, you know, uh, it's, it's connected. So let me give you the test of canosity here because I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, number one. Is the book connected to an apostle? Not every book in the New Testament is connected to an apostle, but almost all of them are. So um, is the book connected to an apostle? Number two, do churches throughout the world use this book? I mean, if you've got me and one other person saying this book is, is true and accurate and right, and you got 25 people in the room saying, no, it's not. Then we need to prove it. There's. And, and you have to take this with a little bit of consideration, but, you know, I mean, if there's 50 people doing something and there's one person not doing it, does that mean those 50 people are right? No, not at all. Um, I mean, that, not at all. <laughs> However, oftentimes when you've got, you know, think of it this way. If I went out and asked 10 people that I knew that I felt were full of the Holy Spirit and uh, love God and their life proved it, and I asked them all a question, and then I went out and asked 10 other people that weren't full of the Holy Spirit and asked them the same question, whose answer should I take? You know, I mean, they'd be different answers. And even within the 10, they might vary a little bit. But for the most part, the 10 that are full of the Holy Spirit, if they're all led by the Holy Spirit, guess what? They're all going to come up with the same answer, right? I mean, that's just the way it's going to happen. Uh, one time I went and to interview for a job uh, years ago, and it was a, I was going to be a, a leader in this campground. And uh, I thought God was moving me somewhere, and I, I wasn't sure where. So I went to the campground, and, uh, and uh, after I had the interview, um, I thought, you know, I the, the job was very appealing to, in a lot of ways. But I thought, I if I don't think this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so if him and I, the guy that was interviewing me uh, for this position, I said, if we're both followed by the Holy Spirit, we're going to come to the same conclusion, <laughs> you know. And uh, he called me up and said, you know. I would love to have you here. He goes, I just don't feel like it's quite right. And I said, good answer. Because <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> you know, I want to come too. But it just wasn't quite right, you know. And I was never sorry I didn't take it. You know, and I mean, he probably wasn't sorry either. But but uh, I think when you got a lot of people. And so do churches throughout the world use this book? I mean, if, if yes, then that that's. The, you know, if they're godly people leading the churches and godly people in the churches, that's going to give some authority uh, weight, you know, of, of what's what's canonical. And number three, does the book agree with what we already know about God? It has to agree with what we already know to be true from the Old Testament. So that's that's very important. So. And by the way. Just a side note, in case you want to write this down back on page 87. Um, by about the year 200, the New Testament was agreed upon as it is today, except for a very few exceptions. All 27 books were generally accepted by the beginning, uh, by the year 200, and 
almost everybody accepted them by the fourth century. So, the, you know, the beginning of the third century. So, um, and then in 393, <clears throat> um, they were adopted at the Council of Carthage, uh, 393. And, and when we say the fourth century, make sure you get this clear because this is confusing to people. The fourth century doesn't mean from 400 to 500. That's the fifth century. Because the first century is zero to 100. The second century is 100 to 200, right? And I, I used to get that mixed up in my head all the time. So in the third, in the fourth century, which was 300 to 400, that's when it was was pretty well accepted. Um, any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, let me give you a couple different councils here. The Council of Nicaea, um, and these were church councils that um, basically what they did was they kind of um, they kind of shaped Christianity. You know what I'm saying? And that's what they do. They kind of they kind of shape. Do you need the answers? I can make copies of this one done, so you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. You can. She probably writes better than I do. I can make copies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't realize that, or I made it to you before. Um, the church councils, and there were a number of church councils that met, and church councils were good because that's when they got together and had issues to deal with. I mean, Christianity is fairly new and they're still trying to figure it out. And when you've got thousands upon thousands of people and literally thousands of churches, I mean, you somebody's got to have a governing body over them because, I mean, we all know what mankind's like, right? You, people need a shepherd. They need somebody to guide them. They need somebody to say, this is authoritative. This is not. You can say this. You can't say that. So all of that's pretty important. And so how we, what theology we teach, what theology we, we put into practice, um, this, this needs to be uh, determined. And so the first one is the, the Council of Nicaea, and that happens in about 318. And uh, there was what's called the Arian controversy. And this is about, mostly about the deity of Christ, because there were people that did not believe that Christ was divine. They believed that he was created by God. Um, and that is a very common belief um, that that would be a belief of uh, of the Mormons that Satan and, and Christ were both created by God. Um, so in the way they look at it is there are, they call them emanations. Um, like if you throw a, a rock into the water and it leaves a, a ripple and the ripple goes out and goes clear across the pond, it's like when God does something, it has effects that go on and on. And so God created these emanations, these ripples or whatever, and he may have created thousands of them. And Jesus was just one of them, but that doesn't mean he was divine. Um, he could do fantastic things, do miracles, but that doesn't mean he was divine. And so there were a lots and lots of different controversies about Christ and who Christ is, just as there is today. And we not, we're not, for the most part, a part of that, you know, but, but it's still very true. And if you start talking to people of other faiths, other thoughts, even the Jewish beliefs, you know, they don't. I had a lady tell me one time that Jesus wasn't even a good prophet. You know, and she was a Jewish woman, but it's it's uh, there are lots of different beliefs. And so when the Council of Nicaea met, that was uh, a, a council that met to determine what are we going to what what is who is Christ? What do we believe? And what are we going to hold on to? Let's write it out. Let's make it part of life. And then was the Council of Constantinople. This is in 381. And this was. Uh, questioning the humanity of Christ. All right, was he was he God? Now was he a man? And pe some people, like we were talking about Gnosticism, where people think that anything material is not good, that's evil. 
that he couldn't have been man. Um, but the truth is, he had to be man. Without question, he had to be man in order to pay for sin. And so he had to be man. He had to be God, both. And that's the only way that could that could handle um, all of that. So that that was important. And then there was the Council of Ephesus. Um, and there um, was they were questioning the two natures in one person, how you can be God and man. And then um, Mary was declared the mother of God. But. Um, and Theo means means uh, means God, and then uh, Tokos. I think that just simply is a term for a uh, human offspring or, or mother, uh, um, giver of life, or something like that. Um, but that thought got very over a period of time got very much taken. Um, out of the right context um it got over a period of time it got to be that people could start praying to mary it got to be to the point where they said um mary's mother was perfect so that mary could be perfect and it, it, there's just all kinds of um false thoughts about mary um Mary absolutely was the most blessed woman in the world and probably the most cursed, you know, um, because she, what she had to deal with. I mean, she's the one that she knew who Christ was. And uh, <clears throat> but yet she had to endure what, you know, he suffered through and she saw all that. And uh, <clears throat> but she's definitely the most blessed. But it was. Um, she's not God. She's not perfect. She was chosen by God because she was a godly girl. There's no doubt about that. Um, but they had to they had to deal with that. Um, okay, decay and from 560 to 1500. Um, and we could talk about this for a long period of time. Um, we're going to talk a, a little bit about it on the next page. Um, because of the different doctrines that are established um, during this this one church period up to about 1500. Um, but let me just give you some thoughts here. And the rise of the Roman Catholic Church. And this really rose to power um, basically because the Bishop of Rome was considered the highest of the bishops. I mean, he was the Bishop of Rome. Um, Rome was where the Roman Empire ruled from, you know, and uh, he um, and Pope Gregory um, is is the one to that's on down there. But um, what began to happen in Rome was um, Rome became began to become the center of the of the Christian world, um, and the 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 bishop at Rome was um, basically um, the one, the ones who began to claim that uh, apostolic tradition, um, where what the Pope says has value that's equal to Scripture. When he teaches ex cathedra, he has words that are equal to Scripture. Um, they wanted to so control people, and I think. It, to some degree, like we talked about last time, they were wanting to do it in the sense that they didn't want people. I mean, there was a concern among a lot of people in the early centuries that, you know, that Christianity stayed pure, you know, that false religions didn't find their way in. And so there was a certain sense that the church said, we have this authority over the over the people and we want to maintain this authority over the people. And uh, so we have to do everything in our power to make sure that that whoever's leading our denomination, the bishop or it turned into the pope, whatever, that they have uh, some kind of authority that's unequal to anybody else. And so the power of the pope became more and more. And uh, and like I said the other time, sometimes when you have the pope and the emperor are the same person, 
uh, the power of that individual is just unprecedented. There's nobody that has more power uh, than the Pope and the Emperor in that day. And when they were the same person, wow, it was really powerful. So there, and they, they collected taxes and got offerings from tens of thousands of churches, millions of people. And, and, you know, that kind of wealth and that kind of, uh, and c because people, people are committed to religion. They'll give, they'll serve, they'll do for religion what they won't do in any other way. I mean, there's people that, that give and serve their religion more, far more than they ever would their kids, you know, or even life, you know, people will give their life for the religion. And so uh, the power of that, the wealth of all that, the power of leadership of all that, well, what is it going to do? It's going to lead to decay. I mean, it's just going to, because that's what happens to man. There's very few people that are extremely wealthy that can handle it, that don't go off the deep end one way or the other. Um, Jesus even said it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You know, it's it's just very, very hard because wealth just takes over. Um, some people can handle it, but very, very few people are super wealthy. And uh, um, any thoughts on that? Okay, the importance of Pope Gregory the First. He lived from about 560 to about 640, so he had about 80 years there. Um, he was very well known among the Christians, loved by the Christians of the day. In fact, John Calvin said about him that he was the last good pope. <laughs> that's what that's what John Calvin said. Um, so. And and he's and Pope Gregory is really important because he wrote a lot, and and uh, his writings established certain beliefs that even the Catholic Church held to and and does still hold to, um, and he created many traditions that lasted a long time. Now, and you've probably heard me talk, and even in the New Testament, Paul says not to. Traditions aren't anything that you're to be concerned about. Um, because traditions is can't trump scripture. Um, but I think that I think there are some things that the Catholic Church does do right. They they um, they they do things like in liturgy. We do it here sometimes. Um, they have the responsive reading. Um and I know Laura loves responsive readings, right? And I like them too. And I've actually had very liturgical services at times, just like on a, like at communion across or something like that. Um, but there is something that, to be said about doing something in a way where people respond. So they're interactive. I think the Catholics do it right in a sense where I don't, I'm, I'm not convinced that all the priests and popes and even pastors need to have pulled in holy garments and all that kind of stuff. You know, um, I did that. I thought of that a little bit more when I was younger. I have, I had a robe that I wore every time I married somebody simply because if I didn't, I was the worst dressed person there when everybody else has tux on. I don't care now. So, but, but I used to, um, but I, but I think there's something to be said about there's a high reverence. Um, I think there's something to be said about smell. You go into Catholic church, they're burning incense. Um, there's touch. I mean, they touch holy water. They take communion. There's taste. All your senses are used in a Catholic church. And if you look back at the Old Testament, they burned incense, right? They, they, they ate bread. They, they did all kinds of things. And there was all the senses were a part of their worship. And I, I think we've lost some of that in Protestantism. Um, and I'm not saying we should burn incense every week or anything like that, but, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know what's, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong about it, uh, but I, but I do think there's some things right about it, you know? And so I think we've missed out on some of that. Um, but this, this, this Pope, uh, Gregory, he did institute some, uh, traditions and, um, and some of them have been good. And here's something he did 
and, and it says the importance of, of Pope Gregory. Number one, he solidified the papacy and liturgy. So the papacy, P-A-P-A-C-Y. That means that he solidified the fact that there needs to be one person over everyone. Somebody's in charge. They're the king of the of the religious people. And uh, he solidified that. So that's always been the case. That had not been the case prior to that. Although the Catholics will tell you, they can give you the name of every Pope clear back to Peter, who was the first Pope. Um, but <laughs> that wasn't always the case. Um, secondly, he wrote volumes, which became the heart of Catholicism. Now you got to remember, this is the, we call, we, today we tend to think of the Catholic Church as of what we think of the Catholic Church today. It wasn't always the way it is today. Um, we're in this from we're in the one church period, right? Up to 1500, there's one denomination and it's called the Catholic Church or the Universal Church is a better word. Um, but there's just one group in charge and it's the Pope and it's the Cardinals and it's the priests and they have complete authority. And this Pope Gregory, he wrote volumes about all this kind of stuff and how it was supposed to be organized. And, and uh, in a way it helped a lot. You know, but as time went on, this stuff became more and more. And he's pretty early on. He's 560 to 640. So before there became a lot of corruption and decay in the Catholic Church. Um, and then secondly, he expanded Catholicism through missionary efforts. He wrote volumes. He solidified the papacy and liturgy. Kind of the, the rules of uh, the order of worship type thing and, and how things are done. So Constantine, though, he had like the right vision as far as the way that he, the one world, religion of the one world. So. Um, but it didn't, the whole Catholic Church started developing in the um, 40, 431 AD. Is that when it started to get become the Catholic Church, breaking away from the Christian Church, so the world religion? Well, it it was still the Christian Church. Uh -huh. um, and even today, the Catholics consider them sure. the true Christians. So it's still the Christian Church. It just... It became the obsession, I guess, um, would be the whole like praying to Mary thing. That didn't enter until then. It came later. Okay. Yeah. It came after this. Mm. Okay. Yeah, because the problem with the papacy is that when they speak ex cathedra and when they invoke something, it it's as good as scripture. So when one pope says this is what we're doing, that's part of the life of the church now and it can't be changed because if they change if they say we're gonna okay we're gonna start believing in that that mary you can pray to mary let's say or you can pray to a saint they believe you can pray to saints let's say you okay now we've got this new saint come on saint bernard and no i'm just kidding and, and uh, now you can pray to a saint and and if some pope declares the saint can be prayed to from that point on you can't change that because if some, if the next pope comes along and says, no, you can't pray to that saint. Well, then you take away your power, your authority power. You know what I'm saying? Because then that means the pope before him was wrong. Therefore, the popes aren't the godly men. They aren't the ones that have total authority. And so you can't change anything. So when the pope comes along or they make a decision for purgatory, you can't change that. You know, and I mean, the Pope we got today, man, he's changing all kinds of things. You know, he's much more liberal and uh, that's could be a problem at some point. But um, is that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and after about 500, after about five to six hundred, the the church grew and it became. And well, let's get down here. The last sentence, it says the decline of the Roman Catholic Church. And what you can write down there is, is there were a lot of popes that come after Pope Gregory now. Um, 
but they did not follow his character. And what happened then is something happened then, and you guys are going to recognize this. You'll know as soon as I say it. What happens then is what's called the Dark Ages. That's what the Dark Ages are, because you start getting people. I mean, this is the, the known world, right? And now you got popes in there that are not godly men. And uh, they they um, they actually begin to decline in influence because they're not as godly. And uh, they do damage to the nature of the church. And uh, it just begins to decline again and again. So it's called the Dark Ages, mostly because of the fact that the, 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 there's a decline in the church and there's a decline in the nature of the church. Um, and so what we have on the next page is, um, is several doctrines that were established during this one church period of time, okay? Um, and during this one per church period of time, uh, these doctrines became issues of conflict for many people, and especially when it got to around 1500 and we started talking about the reformers. That's when this stuff really uh, began to happen. And so let's talk about these uh, these seven different sacraments. In fact, that's the first uh, the first one. Number one, the the seven sacraments that impart grace. Um, and, uh, and this includes the Eucharist and also uh, transubstantiation. And the Eucharist is um, I mean, it's it's communion is what's what's Eucharist is called um, in the in the Catholic Church. And then there's a, a word called transubstantiation. You ever heard of that? Yeah, you just you just used it the other day. Didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> this is a Catholic belief that they still believe today. They still believe this today. Catholic Church does. Um, it's it's the belief that the the cup of of wine that they use they use wine every time and the bread when you take it it actually becomes the blood and body of christ it's called tran substance tran substantiation so when you go to a catholic church and i've been to a lot of them in my time and uh, you go to a catholic church and you take communion uh, used to be what they'd do is you'd go up front and kneel and the priest would lean down and you'd drink out of the cup and he'd wipe it off, you know, and drink it and wipe it off. And he just added the germs from the person before every time mm -hmm. he wiped it, you know. And then now they dip it and place it on your tongue, you know. There's some pretty funny, if you go on YouTube, there's some pretty funny videos. I watched one, I'll tell you guys, I wouldn't tell this from the pulpit. I watched one where the lady came in and she had a good bit of cleavage and he put it and he dropped it down. <laughs> And he goes after it. And it's like, it's pretty funny because she's not supposed to touch it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So he's going after. Her. But but they that's what they began doing. But you go to a Catholic church and when they get done with the wine, the priest drinks all of it. Right. Every bit. And then he wipes the cup out. And I don't know what they do with the excess wafers. I suppose they put Jesus back in the refrigerator. But, but <laughs> that's the belief. Transubstantiation is taught today and believed by the Catholic Church. Um, they've they've believed that, and it's one of the one of the the sacraments. And so um, that that's what's called the Eucharist. Um, is the is the communion and wine, and they take it every week. And you know, I I think to some degree that's a good thing. Um, I mean, we know the disciples. They met every day and broke bread. That don't mean they had communion every day, but I expect that they had it quite often. Remember Christ. The problem with that is if you do something rep repetitiously, that's what it becomes. It's just another, you know, repetition. I mean, if I ask you what you had lunch for yesterday, you might be able to tell me. If I ask you what you had the day before, you probably can't tell me. If I ask you what you had last Wednesday, 
almost no chance. You know what I'm saying? Because you're you're doing something, even though you might have had something really unique, different every day. Um, you really got to do it quite unique to do it. Um, Chrissy was talking to somebody the other day and they have they only have communion at their church once, sometimes twice a year. But when they have it, it's a big deal. It's like a four hour service. They really put a lot into it. And uh, we try to do that with communion at the cross to make it a little bit more special. And we here we try to do it about once a quarter, maybe five times, six times a year. Um, I don't I don't know what the answer is. Jesus just says, when you do this, remember me, you know, so we can do it as often as we want. But it's just bread and grape juice. It doesn't turn into blood. It's a symbol. Right. That's what it is. It's a symbol. And that's all it was ever intended to be. So number two, the rise of the papacy and priesthood. This is um, this is the what's called the confirmation. Um, so it call you call these men father, which is really ironic because Jesus said, "Don't call anyone father." Right? Um, it's called sacerdotalism, uh, clergy dressing differently. The fact that that the, this this confession, they you need to confess your sins to the priest. Uh, there's this celibacy issue that the priests need to be celibate, and then the kissing of the ring of the feet of of the pope. Um, so you um, so these these things became a part of the church where you would say, Father, you know forgive me for I've sinned and you go on and you start telling them about all of your sins, you know, um, the fact that the clergy dress differently, quite a bit differently. Um, the fact that you have to confess your sins to the priest and the Catholic church even goes as far as saying that you have to do that because the priest is the only one that can forgive your sins. And that was one of the problems with Martin Luther. Martin Luther uh, broke away from the Catholic church. One of his problems was, he was and he was driving the priest nuts because he'd go to the church and go in and confess for three or four hours every little bitty thing he could possibly think of. And then one day he thought, what if I do something wrong and I don't know it and I don't confess it? Hey, something's wrong here. You know, and then he realized by reading studying the scriptures that, you know, that's not what we're called to do. And so um, that was that's pretty important. And then. The whole celibacy issue, God never intended that. They take a verse from the Apostle Paul saying it's better to be celibate. Um, and in some instances, it might be better to not be married in the sense that you're free to go and do and serve, you know, and that's what monks believe. That's what nuns believe. And some of them can give their whole heart because when you get married, then you've got somebody else you have to share decisions with, you know, Um um, so it, it, if God calls you to that, great. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but for most people, that's not what God calls you to. For most people, what God says is multiply, you know, get married, care for each other, multiply, fill the earth. Um, you know, I don't think God ever intended for somebody to be alone, but I think there are people who are godly people who aren't married, who have great friends. And that for them, that's that fulfills, you know, their their desires. But for other people, you know, not a chance. And so I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer to that, but I don't think it should be a demand of all clergy. And uh, I mean, we've seen in recent years how this hasn't solved the sex issue with the clergy. I mean, the Catholics have gotten a lot of trouble with that and it's still not done by a long shot. Um, still. Uh, so that's really all of those things are um, this uh, this this whole part of this is uh, this rise of the you know the popes and the priesthood to their positions um, has has really altered uh, things a lot. And number three, the emphasis on Mary, and this is by praying to Mary. Um, Mary, the mother of God, it's called Mariology, it's called, is a study of Mary, 
Um, they have rosaries. That's what you do with the rosary. You're praying to Mary. Um, she, they say that one of the things I say about Mary was that she had perpetual virginity. She didn't have any other kids. That is not true. Scripture is very clear about that, that Jesus had brothers and sisters, both. The scripture teaches that. Um, when they say, when Jesus uh, goes to his hometown, they said, don't we know him? Don't we know his mother? Don't we know his brothers and sisters are here with us? I mean, it's very clear. Jesus had brothers and sisters. He only had one. Uh, the difference was they were stepbrothers and sisters because Jesus, father was the Holy Spirit. Um, but Mary, after Christ was born, her and Joseph had other other children as well. Um, of course, they have, they believe in the immaculate conception and the assumption that Mary's mother was perfect. Um, I think her name was was it Helen. I can't think what her they call her. Um, anyway, that's their their whole belief on on that. And then there's the, the canonization of the dead to sainthood. This is where um, they take people. Man, if we keep it up, I'm going to get a, another week out of this. I am. Um, I knew there were several pages left. I didn't realize it was fine. Um, the canonization of, uh, of the dead. This is really kind of interesting. This has kind of been interesting to me because um, the church I pastored in Indiana was a uh, when I when I le I left here in 2002 and went back to Indiana, which is close to my home, and uh, our denomination is there, our our uh, university is there, and I, I'm very familiar with all that because I worked for the university for eight years and uh, got got both my degrees there, so I'm very familiar with the area. And we had a, a church there in Huntington called Good Shepherd Church, and it was um, a monastery. And uh, when I first went back to Indiana, they wanted me to interview at another church. And that's where I had thought I would be. And then at the last minute, they said, we want you to interview at Good Shepherd. And uh, I said, OK, I knew the church. I'd even attended there for a little while, years before. And uh, this church was a monastery, it used to be a monastery. Um, it was uh, on a 30 acres. Uh, There's 190 rooms in that church. And there were eight of us on staff. I was the senior pastor there. And I, it was a very, very blessed time for me. I had, I, the eight the people were on staff, um, three of them I had hired. Uh, the other ones were already there. And we were, we were close-knit. Literally, the five years I was there, we never had one single conflict between anybody on the staff. I mean, we just loved each other. Still some of my best friends. And... Uh, that that church was just very very unique and um my office when i walked out my office um i had this great big huge office and i had a fireplace at one end i don't know why they won't give me one here but anyway um <laughs> i walked out my office and you could go out and there was it was shaped like a great big u and it was fifty five thousand square feet there's four stories and i you go out my office and you could go down and go up these big set of steps and down the next hallway um and we had we had uh, we'd been fixing up all these rooms in the building because we had retreats there all the time. We had to have because the cost of maintaining that facility, our utility bills were two hundred dollars a day. <laughs> we needed two hundred dollars a day just to pay for utilities. So we had all these retreats and we'd fixed up one whole with the third floor. We fixed up one whole wing. We fixed up the, this. We were going to fix up this other one. And there was this one room down the hallway, about halfway down the hallway. And uh, and the the church was famous. That monastery was famous um, because there was a guy by the name of Father Casey Solanus. He had been in Detroit and they said he could heal people and people flocked to him. So they wanted to get him out of Detroit because he never had a minute to spare. So they moved him to Huntington in like 1940. And uh, he still was getting over 100 letters a day in Huntington. And still people came to see him. He replied to every single letter. I mean, this guy, he was a saint anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, he was in that church somewhere. And um, so anyway, this second floor, there's this room halfway down the hallway. It had a padlock on the door and I went by it several times. And I There's so many rooms, right? You know, you don't go in all of them. And uh, I went by there and 
I asked the maintenance guy, he lived in one end of the building, and I asked him, I'll go, what's in that room? He goes, I, he'd lived there for years. He goes, I have no idea what's in that room. And so I asked the elders at the next elders meeting, I said, what's in that room up there? And all none of them knew. I thought, you got to be kidding me. I hadn't been there very long. It's like, I got to know what's in this room. This is driving <laughs> me crazy, you know? And so um, I brought my bolt cutters in from home and, and, and cut the lock off. Well, here... I opened the door and over in the corner was four boxes and the boxes had Krager rims, like for a race car, you know, like a hot rod street car. Those the old Chrome right Krager. There's four of them brand new. And, uh, and the rest of the room was, uh, it was Casey Salinas's room, had his bed, had an old desk, a really old telephone. And, 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 uh, I found out that was his room. Well, then right after that, uh, like a month or so after that, well, I thought that was his room, okay? We had, I got a call from the priest in town and he said they had a group of, of retired monks coming to town and he was one, they had all lived in Good Shepherd because it used to be like a uh, Catholic university. They taught them theology and most of them were there for two years. They lived there for two years while they were training to be priests. And these guys wanted to come back and see the building and uh, and take a tour. You know, they'd all lived there. And so when we got down that hallway, I asked him, I go, whose room was this? All of them, Casey Solanus. Everybody knew that had been Casey Solanus' room. So uh, I took the door that had a big wooden thing in the middle of the door. I took it out and put glass in it, had some edge glass on it. And I put stuff on the outside about Casey Solanus. And I found a robe, an old monk robe, and put it across the bed. And people loved that room. Well, then after I left Good Shepherd, they decided the church, the pastor took over. They decided to sell the place because it, it was just it was a behemoth. I mean, we had five people to mow every week. We had 30 acres to mow. So, I mean, you could go and run the vacuum cleaner all day and nobody would know it. And we had we had 13 bathrooms and 52 toilets. So, I mean, and we had showers. I mean, like I said, just the maintenance and everything. And so they decided to sell it. Well, who wants to buy that place? I mean, it's who's going to buy it? Well, this millionaire guy from Fort Wayne was a Catholic. He came in and was looking at it, saw that room, bought it. It's like that. He wanted he's wanted to honor Casey Solanas. And so he put like, oh, millions, millions into the building, redid all the bathrooms, everything, made it back Catholic. And now it is a it's a. Uh, it's a, a monastery again, um, but there's only a few guys in it. The Catholics sold it because they didn't have enough priests. That's why they got rid of it to start with. Um, but this guy, Casey Salatas, it what made me think of that? He's going through the process. Uh, they're going through the process of getting him to become a saint. I think they're at the last step. So, yeah. And so if he makes it through this last step, I'm going to be able to pray to this guy. And say, I know where your room is, but you know, it's like, <laughs> but, huh? Uh, it was in the forties, forties and fifties. Uh huh. Look, well, thirties and forties. And he's got books written about him, you know. And I found a violin in the church one day, and he played the violin. I still got it. It might have been his, but I don't. Know. One of these days, I'll pick it up and I'll be able to play like an angel, you know. Although, although it didn't have any strings or nothing, you know. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Nobody knows. And that church, and what's so weird about it, that the church bought that place in 1981. And I got there in 2002. And that room had never been opened <laughs> all that time. But there was so, I mean, th there was so much to do in that building. Like that building was completely self sufficient. Like you could go downstairs and there was a room like, oh, large, like four or five times bigger. And this was their woodworking shop. And when the Catholics sold the church to the, the church that bought it was called Grayston Avenue. And uh, my boss actually attended that church. He was with it when they bought it. And they were like 80 people. And they bought it for $150,000, all 30 acres, the entire building, because the Catholics wanted a church to have it. And uh, they walked from their current church to this new one, which was like a mile and a half across town. They walked on one Sunday morning. And uh, when they walked into that church, the Catholics just, they left everything. They took all their statues. They left all the woodworking equipment. 
all of it. I mean, every room you went to, everything was left. They just walked out and left everything. So well, they knew that whoever got it couldn't operate. The only thing um, they they did take the pews, so they had to buy chairs and put in a sanctuary. But um, like all the dishes and, and there's two different kitchens, all the dishes and everything. I mean, fully loaded. All the kitchen equipment they had them the stainless steel where you'd lift it up and slide a tray of dishes in it and close it and wash it. You know, it was a, a kitchen like that, like a commercial kitchen because they were feeding them 150 moms at one point. So, um, but Anyway, this Casey Solanos, I mean, it's just so interesting to think that that here's a guy, just a local guy, who apparently God had very blessed him. I mean, there's all kinds of stories about lives he changed, and maybe he did. I mean, I, God can do what he wants to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, here's a guy that once it takes a long time, but they take them through this canonization process. Um, they have to be dead. <laughs> nobody's the saint while they're living right they got to be dead and they got to go through this long process um they've been working they were working on that when i got there in 2002 and it's still not done so it's a long long process before they make you into a saint but once they do and the authorities of the catholic church render somebody a saint then then they build statues to him and, and they've actually got a place in detroit a, a museum and one whole section of the museum is dedicated to Casey Salonis. So anyway, just kind of an interesting thing. Sorry, I took too long on that. Praying the rosemary, um, rosary, not rosemary. I'd do that in my backyard, couldn't I? A rosary. Praying the rosary is a part of their uh, established doctrine. Um, the sale of indulgences. This is huge. I mean, absolutely huge is the sale of indulgences that issue alone has probably brought more income other than maybe purgatory into the catholic church than any other thing people would would uh pay for blessings they would pay to see something every church had a piece of the cross or a piece of straw from the manger or uh a relic from St. Peter or whatever it may be. Um, and then they could also pay for blessings. And then the last one is the doctrine of purg purgatory. Um, the doctrine of purgatory was um, that, you know, that people, when they die, depending on how bad they are, they go to this holding tank and they suffer it's purgatory. They suffer. And they might get whipped. They might have to sit in fire or whatever. And once they've paid for their sin, then they can get out of purgatory. Um, and so that doctrine, just my guess, I'd have to look into it more. I haven't studied that in years. And I don't really intend to either unless somebody wants me to. Um, that doctrine was probably put into place for financial gain by somebody it wasn't godly by one of the popes because people pay Chrissy and I know somebody that gave $2,500 when somebody died to get them out of purgatory. So it still is a viable belief in the Roman Catholic church today. Probably most Catholics don't know much about it because for the most part, a lot of Catholics just go to church and leave, go to church, pray. They believe when you go, you just confess your sins, leave, you're good. You can do anything you want all week long. Go back, repent again. There's no relationship with God. It's just you go, repent, say you're sorry, leave. I'll be back next Sunday and repent for whatever I'm going to do this week. Um, it's not a relationship with God. And so, and, and then the whole concept of purgatory is, is just so evil because that really says Christ's death wasn't sufficient. That you could actually pay for your own sins. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's really, really evil. Because it, it means Christ's death was not good enough. I mean, if you can pay for your own sin. And you believe that's true. Then Christ must be a fool for dying. People can pay for their own sin, right? I mean, that's ridiculous to think that. I mean, 
nobody has ever paid for any sin, no matter even the smallest one. You can't you can't pay for it. It's it's paid for by Christ. And so that um that's a these these doctrines are pretty uh pretty different. Any thoughts about any of them? I mean, and this, when you think about this, this is sin approved at the highest level of the Catholic Church. And people today, there's Protestant organizations, denominations today say, well, let's partner with the Catholic Church and let's let's get the world on fire for Christ together. No, I'm not partnering with the Catholic Church. Not a chance. They are not godly the denominator they're not their doctrines are not godly they're not biblical and and along the way they've added other books to their bible as well um so well page 90 is where we jump into the reformation this is a whole new thing and uh there's lots to talk about with that as well so maybe we'll squeeze a couple more nights out of this it's not too boring for you I have a question about the big church. So was it like tithing that funded all of that stuff? Like the that funded what? Like two hundred dollar bill, like electricity bill a day. That's why we had retreats all the time. So we like there was money. you ever heard of the, yeah. yeah, there's a group called Emmaus. It's called the Emmaus Walk. Um I think it started with the United Methodist Church, but it's a an independent group and they get people to go on spiritual retreats where you go for the weekend. And uh, it's really well done. And they, in fact, they had, I gave them a, a, a room like twice, three times the size of this one, just to store their stuff. Um, because they used it not every weekend, but almost once a month. And they'd bring in 150 people. And we got a good bit of money from that. We also let anybody could go and stay all night. All you had to do is come in, pay 35 bucks, go get a room, stay overnight. So... Um, we encourage people to call ahead. We had a lot of college students who would come to stay because some of the college classes, they'd have to come in for two nights where they stayed one night or they'd have three days of classes and they'd stay two nights. Well, that was great for them working to stay for 35 bucks. So we did that. And I mean, a congregation was like two something, but we had a lot of students because of the college town. So and they don't really give anything, but but we didn't hire any, believe it or not, we paid nobody to clean. We had the one maintenance guy, but basically what he did was fill toilet dispensers, paper towel dispensers, because he had a full-time job. So he just got to live in the building for helping. But um, yeah, huge amount of money. Huh? Well, what we did was we had everybody in the church, we encouraged people to adopt a room and one room is yours. And so if a retreat came in, you had to go take all the sheets off. And there were um, laundry chutes. We had, there was laundry chutes like you'd throw up through this hole in the wall and it'd go clear to the basement. And then the one we had a food bank and a clothing ministry there. And that lady was employed and we paid her to do laundry because there was commercial washers and dryers. Like the, the, the dryer was like this big around from like the 30s, about that thick. And that thing would spin like a turban. <laughs> I mean, it would really move. Um, and that's what dried them was that. And so she was paid to do the laundry. But but then when what you did was you, if you adopted a room, you would go, you'd vacuum it, you'd take the sheets off, and then you put new sheets on, get it ready for the next retreat. And and we never had any problems with that. We always had plenty of people doing that. Some people had six, eight rooms, which, you know, but it was it was a behemoth. I mean, because literally, if that place would have burned down, we'd, you wouldn't build it again. Ain't no way. Yeah, it was too much for a church because the, the problem that I had with it, because I wanted to sell it. I, actually, I wanted to tear it down. Um, but the problem I had with it, we had five people come in and mower every week. And they were, they're good people. One of them was a lady and the other. And we provided the mower and the gas and everything. And they'd go out and mow for four or five hours and come in thinking, yep. I did I did my share of ministry, which is okay, but it's mowing grass ministry. <laughs> I mean, it's keeping the church alive to some degree, but 
You know what I mean? It, you, you have all of this work being done, which needs to be done. I mean, somebody has got to clean, but there's dozens and dozens of hours going into that where if that would have been going towards helping somebody grow in their faith, you know what I mean? It just seemed like, why do you want to keep a building up? Because the building just, it just sucked everything dry, really. So, and there was always work that needed to be done. I mean, all the time. I mean, the, the furnaces were old. One, one week the furnace went off on Sunday morning. So we passed out and we had hundreds of blankets. We passed out blankets. Everybody came, everybody sitting around, <laughs> frozen. It was cold. But it, it was, the building, you just, you fell in love with it because it was so cool and so old, you know, and and it just had such a, a history, you know, it was a very cool place. So I was kind of glad when that guy bought it because he put a ton of money into it. And I've called him twice now and said, hey, I'm going to be back. I did take a tour on it through it one time when, uh, after they he got it all done, he put millions into it, and um, um, I got to take a tour through part of it, you know, to see stuff. But I wanted to show Chrissy at some point, but um, and they they said they could, but the lady couldn't do it when we were back last time. So at some point maybe, but had three hundred and thirty windows, not counting the sanctuary and the choir loft. Yeah. And when them old monks went through there, oh my gosh, they made me cry. We got it. There's a there's one room called the choir loft. It's really long, like hundred feet or more long, and it's wide, really high, and it's got oak seats built in, two rows of them, and each monk had their own seat. And they met in there like I think six times a day, seven times a day, every day, and every single day they chanted all 150 psalms every day. And they, they each had their seat and they sang. And then guys, I'm not, it about gives me tears now. Those guys came in and sat down. And I asked the guy that was head, I go, did, I said, did they sing with? He goes, oh, yeah. And they started singing. Oh, man, it was awesome. <laughs> Very awesome. And them guys were just like, they're all crying, you know. And then they'd tell me like, yeah, I remember so-and-so went down that way. And I leaned out the window and dumped a bucket of water on his head, you know? And, <laughs> and, and then we had a, they built pool. We had a, a full giant pool where we sold memberships to the pool. And, and there's just a million things to do, but, but was it ministry, you know, it's just, it was a behemoth to upkeep, but anyway. What's that? Oh, do you? Oh yeah. Very he was married down in uh, Sunken Gardens, but we went back in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could get lost in there. Yeah, it's called St. Felix is the name of it. Um, it's in Huntington, Indiana, but if you type in St. Felix, you'll, you'll find it. Huntington, Indiana. 